We have to go back to the beginning. As Malcolm X revealed to us in a homemade education, going back and examining your history, your roots, can be both informative and liberating. So in our course, we are kind of retracing the history of ideas that unfolded over about two and a half millennia from the ancient Greek and Mediterranean world up to the present day. So our next set of readings will be excerpts from the works of a group of thinkers who are sometimes thought of as the pre-Socratic philosophers, which simply means that they were before Socrates. They're also sometimes called the Ionian philosophers, which is a reference to a part of the Mediterranean region where some of them lived. After reading Malcolm X, I personally feel that both of those designations are inaccurate, and I've gone instead with the title Mediterranean philosophers because it simply describes where many of them lived, and that place was truly intercultural, neither Western nor Eastern, neither European or quote unquote third world. So the Mediterranean Sea lies north of Africa, south of Europe, and the area that we think of as the Middle East is over here. The thinkers we're going to be reading, whose works we're going to be reading and discussing, were from this region, some of them from Alexandria in Egypt, some from Ionia, which is the coast of present-day Turkey, from Greece, from Elia in Italy. So we can think of them as the Mediterranean philosophers, and we can think of this time in history as the beginnings of Western philosophy. Ancient Greek culture, as you know, like many, if not all, ancient human cultures, began in mythic consciousness with a mythological worldview. In a mythological worldview, as you know, nature and human life is thought to be deeply influenced by supernatural powers, gods, goddesses, good and evil spirits, in ancient Greece, you're probably familiar with many of these figures, the movement of the sun across the sky was mythically portrayed as the movement of a chariot driven by the god, the deity, Apollo, from the eastern horizon to the western horizon. Goddesses known as the muses were thought to inspire poets and artists and dramatists. Athena, the goddess of wisdom and of war was the patroness of the ancient Greek city-state of Athens. Persephone, the daughter of Demeter or Ceres, according to the myth, was captured by the god Hades, the god of the underworld, and brought to the underworld and forced to be with him. And her, her stay in the underworld six months out of the year and her emergence into the upper world is connected with the changing of the seasons, fall into winter and then back into spring. The chief of the gods in the ancient Greek pantheon, of course, was Zeus, called Jupiter by the Romans. In this ancient artwork from a, an amphora or a vase, Zeus is portrayed as holding his spear, which was the thunderbolt. So, of course, there was this mythical idea that spears of lightning, which seemed to jolt down from the sky to the earth and are frightening and powerful, perhaps were the spears of the god Zeus. Today we know that myth is much, much more than a sort of naive explanation for natural phenomena, and yet that is a huge part of what it was in the ancient world. Natural phenomena and some of the uncontrollable or mysterious aspects of human life were explained in terms of the influence of gods and goddesses. With the Mediterranean philosophers between 600 and 200 BC, so about a millenn two and a half millennia ago, two and a half thousand years ago, there was what has been called a sort of great awakening, when individuals began to think more rationally about how the natural world works. These people were fascinated with the workings of the natural world. They observed, they strove to understand it. 
So the Mediterranean philosophers could be said to have moved Western thought from the world of myth to the world or the, th the thought world of natural philosophy. Natural philosophy today is called science. So these people were the first scientists. Among their convictions were these three key ideas. The universe has order. Order means that there are patterns in the way things work that we can discern. Something very simple. If you drop an object, it's going to fall. It's not going to go up. It's going to go down. That's order. So the universe has order, predictability, patterns. We human beings can perceive and understand and explain that order through reason. The Greek term for reason is the word logos. It translates into Latin as the word verbum, and it simply means word. Malcolm X, as we discussed in seminar, was passionate about words, about grasping, reading, speaking, and understanding words. So this concept of the word as being the very root of thought, our human capacity to make sense out of things, to explain things to each other in speech using reason, this was a key idea for the ancient philosophers. So the universe has order, cosmos in Greek, giving us the English word cosmos, and we can understand it through reason, or logos. The beginnings, therefore, of what we today think of as all of the physical sciences can be traced back to this time in the ancient world. And science isn't just a collection of facts. It is not a collection of facts. Science is really a way of thinking. Scientific inquiry is really the search for basic principles that serve as explanatory keys for the phenomena, the observable experiences that we have in our lives. The Greek word for this is arche, which simply means principle, source, or beginning, or cause. So the Mediterranean philosophers were searching for the arche that could explain the many different observable phenomena in the world and in human life. So you'll see each of them as you read them, looking for an explanatory master key. And each of them had a different idea of what it was. Some of those ideas today we would say were probably wrong. Some of them today we would say are still dead on. So towards the end of this lecture, we'll take a quick look at each of the philosophers who will be studying and talk about what they thought was the archaic. I wanted to contrast the artwork depicting Zeus with his lightning bolt spear with this photographer of a contemporary researcher, a storm chaser, using his equipment to observe lightning bolts. So today we think very differently about what lightning is. And that's a symbol of this form of thought that we call science that really had its origins with the Mediterranean philosophers. The Mediterranean philosophers used a critical thinking skill called inference. We use it all the time, but most of the time we're not aware of it. The Mediterranean philosophers made themselves become aware of it and use it intentionally. Inference is a form of reasoning where you start with observations, information, experiences, data. These could be personal observations that you make with your five senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch you yourself, or they could be data that are collected by researchers. But inferences start with information, observations, and they leap, they infer the likely story behind those observations. It often means reasoning from cause to effect. This kind of reasoning is the basis of the physical sciences. At bottom, every science is a form of inference. It's also, for you criminal justice majors, you'll recognize it as the basis of criminal investigation. I have a clip for you to illustrate what inference is. Take a look. It's the opening scene from the movie Beavis and Butthead. These guys are two complete losers who spend most of their time sitting on their couch, watching TV, or getting into various misadventures. And in this clip, they have fallen asleep on the couch, and they're just waking up and they realize something is missing from their house. So Butthead makes a series of observations. You and I would think he's being stupid, and he is. 
But in a way, he's also being a good critical thinker because he focuses very carefully on each of these observations and then he makes an inference. So as you watch, identify what the observations are and then identify what the inference is. So, the ancient Mediterranean philosophers, just like Bevis and Butthead, found ways intentionally to use the skill of inference. One of those philosophers was called Eratosthenes. He lived in Alexandria, an ancient and illustrious city in Egypt. I want you now to watch a clip from an old classic television series called Cosmos. Carl Sagan, a physicist, who taught at Cornell University, was the first scientist to use television to help lay people understand science and how it came about and how it works. But in this clip, and yes, it's dated, so you're going to see the hairstyle and you're going to see cinematography that looks kind of grainy. But in this clip, he's going to explain to you how this ancient thinker, Eratosthenes, used some very simple tools and his brain to make a key scientific inference that is still valid today. This form of reasoning is the kind of reasoning that all of the Mediterranean philosophers used. So watch this, think about it, understand it, and then when you do the readings, apply it to how the other Mediterranean philosophers thought. As you listen, think about these questions and jot down notes. Who was Eratosthenes? Where and when did he live? What did he discover about the world, and how did he do it? How did his curiosity, a kind of Malcolm X style of curiosity, enable him or motivate him to make this discovery? And how did he use observation and inference? There was once a time when our little planet seemed immense when it was the only world we could explore. Its true size was first worked out in a simple and ingenious way by a man who lived here in Egypt in the third century BC. This tower may have been a communications tower, part of a network running along the North African coast by which signal bonfires were used to communicate messages of state. It also may have been used as a lighthouse, a navigational beacon for sailing ships out there in the Mediterranean Sea. It is about 50 kilometers west of what was once one of the great cities of the world, Alexandria. In Alexandria at that time, there lived a man named Eratosthenes. One of his envious contemporaries called him Beta, the second letter of the Greek alphabet, because he said Eratosthenes was second best in the world in everything. But it seems clear that in many fields, Eratosthenes was alpha. He was an astronomer, historian, geographer, philosopher, poet, theater critic, and mathematician. He was also the chief librarian of the great library of Alexandria. And one day, while reading a papyrus book in the library, he came upon a curious account. Far to the south, he read, at the frontier outpost of Syene, something notable could be seen on the longest day of the year. June 21st, the shadows of a temple column or a vertical stick would grow shorter as noon approached. And as the hours crept towards midday, the sun's rays would slither down the sides of a deep well, which on other days would remain in shadow. And then, Precisely at noon, columns would cast no shadows, and the sun would shine directly down into the water of the well. At 
that moment, the sun was exactly overhead. It was an observation that someone else might easily have ignored. Uh, sticks, shadows, reflections in wells, the position of the sun, simple everyday matters of what possible importance might they be. But Eratosthenes was a scientist, and his contemplation of these homely matters changed the world, in a way, made the world. Because Eratosthenes had the presence of mind to experiment, to actually ask whether, back here, near Alexandria, a stick cast a shadow near noon on June the 21st. And it turns out, sticks do. An overly skeptical person might have said that the report from Syene was in error, but it's an absolutely straightforward observation. Why would anyone lie on such a trivial matter? Eratosthenes asked himself how it could be that at the same moment, a stick in Syene would cast no shadow, and a stick in Alexandria, 800 kilometers to the north, would cast a very definite shadow. Here's a map of ancient Egypt. I've inserted two sticks, or obelisks, one up here in Alexandria, and one down here in Syene. Now, if at a certain moment, each stick casts no shadow, no shadow at all, that's perfectly easy to understand, provided the Earth is flat. If the shadow at Syene is at a certain length, and the shadow at Alexandria is the same length, that also makes sense on a flat Earth. But how could it be, Eratosthenes asked, that at the same instant there was no shadow at Syene and a very substantial shadow at Alexandria? The only answer was that the surface of the Earth is curved. Not only that, but the greater the curvature, the bigger the difference in the lengths of the shadows. The sun is so far away that its rays are parallel when they reach the Earth. Sticks at different angles to the sun's rays will cast shadows at different lengths. For the observed difference in the shadow lengths, the distance between Alexandria and Syene had to be about seven degrees along the surface of the Earth. By that I mean, if you imagine these sticks extending all the way down to the center of the Earth, they would there intersect at an angle of about seven degrees. Well, seven degrees is something like a fiftieth of the full circumference of the Earth, 360 degrees. Eratosthenes knew the distance between Alexandria and Syene. He knew it was 800 kilometers. Why? Because he hired a man to pace out the entire distance so that he could perform the calculation I'm talking about. Now, 800 kilometers times 50 is 40,000 kilometers. So that must be the circumference of the Earth. That's how far it is to go once around the Earth. That's the right answer. Eratosthenes' only tools were sticks, eyes, feet, and brains, plus a zest for experiment. With those tools, he correctly deduced the circumference of the Earth to high precision, with an error of only a few percent. That's pretty good figuring for 2,200 years ago. Here, just as a reminder, is a map that shows us the location of the ancient Mediterranean world. Here we are, Chicago, close to Chicago, Illinois, Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe, the Middle East. So the Mediterranean Sea is this body of water that's among these four continents, three continents, and includes them all. A little bit of a closer up view again, just gives us an idea of where these people were from. We're going to take a look in our reading at five different Mediterranean philosophers. As I explained before, I've gone from thinking of them as pre-Socratic to Ionian to Mediterranean. Their names, and these are fun to pronounce, were Thales, Pythagoras, Heraclitus, Democritus, and Parmenides. So let's talk through each of them, and I'll try to convey a sense of their main ideas 
look for some of those ideas as you do the readings. Thales of Miletus is sometimes called the father of Western philosophy. He was an astronomer and a mathematician, and you're going to see some math in the reading. Try to figure it out. He pioneered navigation by the stars, and I think that the only extant written work that we had from him was some kind of nautical star guide, which helped sailors use the stars to figure out where they were and where they were headed. Aristotle, who is the only, among the, the few authors who preserved Thales' writings and thought, tells us that he was the first to investigate the underlying cause, or arche, or beginning, or source, or basic principle of all things. And Thales was convinced everything is water. Water is somehow at the basis of all of the observable phenomena that we see around us. As you do the reading and think about this question, ask yourself, what is it about water? What observations would have led Thales to make that inference that water is the basis of everything? One of the demonstrations that we're going to see in the reading has to do with mathematics. And all of these philosophers were interested in a whole variety of fields. None of them limited themselves to just one thing. But Thales, observed that if you have a circle and you draw a diameter across the circle that goes through the center, if you draw a line from one end of the diameter to any point on the circle, the circumference, and you then connect that point on the circumference with the other end of the di diameter, this angle is always a right angle, what we would call 90 degrees. Any point on the circumference, here, 90 degrees, here, 90 degrees. Discoveries like this filled Thales and the other ancient philosophers with a sense of wonder. How could that be? It's so amazing. And then, of course, they went about trying to explain it. It was the mathematician Euclid, whose work I'm hoping we'll take a look at, a brief look, who put all these mathematical observations together and used deductive reasoning to prove them. So you'll see that demonstration in Thales, and you'll see his reaction to it, which was typical of an ancient mythological person. Thales also did some inference that was very similar to Eratosthenes. You'll run across this in the reading, try to figure it out. He measured the height of the pyramids using only a person and his shadows and his brain. So imagine the Sears Tower rather than a pyramid and you have to measure the height of it and you don't have any type of equipment that can go up that high physically to measure it directly. What are you gonna do? What happened, or at least what's explained in the reading, is that Thales measured the height of the pyramids by observing the time when the shadow of a person, which you can measure, is equal to the person's height. So at the time of day when the sun is in the sky at just the right position, so that the little man's shadow, the length of his shadow, is equal to his height, at that time of day, if we also observe the shadow of the Sears Tower, then we can measure that shadow along the ground. And we're inferring that the shadow of the Sears Tower will also be equal to its height at that particular time of day. So when you do the reading, see if you can figure that out and maybe do the demonstration for us in seminar. Pythagoras, a philosopher from the island of Samos, was fascinated with math, music, geometry, and human life. You'll see a combination of all of those things in the reading. He was among the first to deduce that the Earth was round, but not the only. Philosophy for him was not just a set of ideas, it was a way of life. And he founded a sort of quasi-religious community. Some of the things you're going to see in the reading include rules that people in that community observed when you're going out to a temple, what you should do. 
we, we today probably would reject the idea that philosophy and religion are the same thing. But I think, and I, I, I truly believe myself, that philosophy is not just something you study in school. It's really something that guides your day-to-day -day way of life. So Pythagoras certainly believed that. Pythagoras was convinced that math or numbers are the explanatory key to everything. And among his, his to me, most wondrous discoveries was the realization that musical intervals, the distances, so to speak, between notes on the diatonic scale, can be explained through simple mathematical ratios. So we can take a glass of water as an example. You see that there's a column of water in this glass that has a certain height that we can measure. And when we tap the edge of the glass, it makes a note on the scale. When we pour some of the water out of the glass, reducing the height of the column of water by one third, the glass gives us a note that's exactly a fifth, a perfect fifth. That's five notes on the diatonic scale, higher than the original note. Those two notes are the basis of the song. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. So you see, yes, I'm a terrible singer. But you see how math, numbers, can explain natural phenomena. Today we take that for granted, but that realization that numbers match up with the patterns that are going on in the world around us is really the basics of all physics in much of science today. And Pythagoras was the one to make that discovery. Heraclitus of Ephesus was a more qualitative philosopher. He was convinced that nothing remains permanent, that everything changes. And yet, this movement is orderly. It happens according to cosmos, order and reason, and we can understand it. One of his, he taught in aphorisms, short oral proverb-like sayings that were probably meant for his students to memorize. And one of his most famous aphorisms is, you can't step into the same river twice. So he questioned the illusions that we have of stability, the illusion we have that everything is really the same. I have this assumption as I move throughout my days that I as a person am the same person I was five minutes ago, or five days ago, or five years ago. I have the assumption that the people around me are the same that when I get home, my husband is going to be the same person that he was when I left in the morning. So as human beings, we have this assumption that things are stable, that they don't change. But Heraclitus was calling that into question. Heraclitus also began to think more in terms of, Pythagoras did as well, but in terms of some of the forces that move the universe. I think he says in one of his aphorisms, the lightning bolt steers all things through all things. Today, we would call that the force of electricity, which is linked to the force of magnetism. Ancient philosophers were fascinated with magnets. This idea that they call them lodestones, and you might see that in your reading. This idea that certain kinds of rocks or metals had the power to attract another. And philosophers like Pythagoras and Heraclitus used an analogy with human relationships. They used the concepts of friendship or love to explain this attraction. Today we wouldn't do that. But these philosophers were thinking very broadly, and they were thinking, well, the same kind of force or power that attracts one human being to another, maybe that's the same kind of force or power that can attract one lodestone to another. So Heraclitus was also thinking about forces, Pythagoras too, forces as an arche or principle of all things. Parmenides of Elia is quite possibly the hardest of the philosophers in our packet to read because he's really doing metaphysics in its purest sense. Unlike Heraclitus, he was convinced that what is real does not change. The things around us that are constantly changing are, are illusory. They don't have reality in the strongest sense. 
So he was looking for an arche or cause that was unchanging or permanent. And he reached toward the idea of being itself. Being is the one principle that every existing reality has in common. So whether it's a roar or a cup of coffee or a person or the air or a star, all of those different entities, even though they're incredibly different, they have one thing in common, and that is being itself. They all are. They all exist. So he was asking, what is this thing called being itself? And it's such a difficult concept to grasp. You can't see it, you can't measure it, you can't touch it, you can't smell it or taste it or perceive it in any way, that he decided to use poetry as a way of helping us as readers rise up toward this concept of being. So he goes back to the image of a chariot, and he portrays himself as riding in a chariot, which is guided by a goddess, ascending into the sky. And he meets a goddess who explains to him the differences between being, being itself, and non-being. And Parmenides was convinced that non-being isn't real. There can't be such a thing as non-being, because you just can't think it. Only being itself is real. And what is most real is totally beyond the physical world. So we can think for ourselves about some of the things we believe in most strongly and realize that those things are not physical. Love, justice, beauty, truth, freedom, human rights. Human rights. Those are not physical things. You can't see them. You can't touch them. You can't measure them. And yet we believe in them. We believe that they are real. We believe that they are always and everywhere true. So Parmenides would have agreed with those ideas, although he himself does not talk about them. It will be left to Plato, who is probably influenced by Parmenides, to talk about some of those ideas. Last but not least, Democritus of Abdera in Thrace agreed with Parmenides that what is real is unchanging, but what is unchanging is not some idea that you can't see or touch or, or really physically get in contact with. It's not unchanging. It's not being itself. But what is really unchanging are basic particles that make up all matter. So what is real is totally physical. Whereas for Parmenides, what is most real is not physical at all. It's being itself. It's an idea. For Democritus, what is real is totally physical. And he came up with the word atomos. Atomos in Greek means not cuttable. That Greek word, not cuttable, in other words, it can't be cut. A particle so small you can't cut it is what we today call atoms. So atoms ex can explain all sorts of changes. You've all seen this demonstration, I'm sure. Take a cup. Take some baking soda for being really scientific, we measure it. So we'll take a tablespoon of baking soda. How do you know it's baking soda? When you taste it, it's bitter. Ugh. And then you mix that baking soda with vinegar, of course. How do you know it's vinegar? I'm not going to taste it. But it's sour. And it smells. So you use, you use your senses to know what these substances are. Mix a little bit of vinegar with the baking soda, and what happens? Probably can't see that from there. The liquid fizzes, rises. And when this change is complete, what's left in the cup is neither bitter nor sour. It has no taste at all. It's water. So the liquid that's left in the cup is water. How can one explain this kind of change? Where a substance that tasted sour or tasted bitter is now gone. Democritus would say the substances didn't change. One substance, one thing, did not change into another thing. Vinegar did not change into water. The baking soda did not disappear. That in fact, what is not changing are these particles that make up the vinegar, particles that make up the baking soda, those things stay the same. They just combine and recombine with each other in different ways. And you'll see his explanation for that in the reading. 
Democritus, too, you might be surprised, was interested in ethics, morality, and human life. So as you read, look at his scientific ideas. He also called the gods into question, and some people therefore thought that he was an atheist. Look throughout all of the readings for what these people say about divinity, about the myths, about the gods, and how they're kind of struggling to reconcile their scientific worldview with the mythical worldviews that they inherited. But also see how Democritus, although he was interested in science, he was also interested in ethics and human life, and see if you can make any connection between his ethical or moral ideas and his scientific ideas. Do this for a journal entry and submit it online. Just a paragraph, but a very strong paragraph with clear main idea, supporting details, lots of supporting details, and a concluding sentence. So in your own words, explain the difference between a mythical worldview or mythic consciousness and a philosophical worldview. Support your explanation with an example of an ancient Greek deity and a thoroughly discussed example of one of the Mediterranean, sorry, not Ionian, philosophers. Post your paragraph via the Blackboard assignment and go back over your notes and take the quiz. Thank you.